But, but in heaven, it's like that. Times a thousand. And you have the hope. It will continue forever. You know it will never end. There's no desire. It's complete contentment. There's nothing like this in the world. You can get a glimpse of it. You can get a taste of it. But in every way, shape, and form, complete fulfillment and contentment forever. That's what heaven is. Hell is real, but heaven is real as well. It's special. It's real. It's not fictitious. So, your time will come. Heaven and hell are real. The third secret, the decision is final. The decision is final. You read there in verse 24 through 26 when they go, wait, but, you know, can you send someone there and can I cross over? And Jesus is like, no, there's no crossing over. There's a chasm that has been fixed and no one can go from here to there. No one can go from there to here. But, but, but. No, the decision is final. We don't like final decisions. You ever see that show, Who Wants to Be a Millionaire? You know, I, I, now they always say, you know, is this your final answer? My final answer? They had to say that because in the beginning people would give an answer and then they're like, that's wrong. It's like, well, that wasn't my final answer. You know, I, had to know, I was just kind of throwing it out there, you know, thinking out loud. So now, like, legally they have to say, is this your final answer? Yes, this is my final answer. So there's no weaseling out because we always want to weasel out of something. It's just the way we are. We want some further appeal. I'm appealing to this judge. We want some further petition. Will you sign my petition? I want to overturn that decision. I want a second chance. I want to talk to your manager. I want to talk to your boss. There's got to be someone else that can turn this over. I need a mulligan. Let's do a do-over. Please, let me beg you. We just always think there's got to be some other way. We don't like the thought that things are final. But this is the decision when it's made when your time comes, is final. By the grace of God, we have so many chances when we're alive. And see, sometimes I get confused. I think, well, that's not fair the decision's final. What if somebody is dying and they want to become a Christian, but they can't get baptized? We try to come up with these hypothetical things to say, you're right, that's not fair. But the fact is we have a whole life full of chances. We have a chance every second of every day that we're alive by the grace of God. There are so many efforts God makes. So many chances God gives. But there's a point that the time comes. And at that point, the decision is final. And it's not fair at all. It's way more than fair. You've been given so many more chances than any of us deserve. But at that point, the decision is final. The grace is has run out. Your time has come. Your time will come. Heaven and hell are real. The decision is final. And fourth, listen to the Bible now. At the end of the story, we'll read this together again. Such a penetrating appeal. He answered, Then I beg you, Father, send Lazarus to my brother's house. For I have five brothers. Let him warn them. So they will not also come to this place of torment. Abraham replied, they have Moses and the prophets. Let them listen to them. No, Father Abraham, he said, but if someone goes from the dead goes to them, then they'll repent. He said to them, if they don't listen to Moses and the prophets, they will not be convinced even if someone rises from the dead. Moses and the prophets. The Bible. They have the Bible. They have the Word of God. He says, that's all they need. But if they saw some super miracle, don't you wonder that sometimes? But, but if you just like do something, why don't you just do something more? You know, just appear to me. Can't you just appear to me? Can't you just float me? You know, can't you just do something like that? And he goes, no, I know the heart of man. I know what you really need. It's the Bible. The Bible's all you need. And they have the Bible. That's enough. There's so many other verses that talk about this. John 12, verse 48, Jesus says, There is a judge for the one who rejects me and does not accept my words. That very word which I spoke will condemn him at the last day. Because there's a judge. I didn't come to judge the world. I'm not the judge. But there is a judge. The word I spoke is the judge. And literally, in the original language, it says that the judge it says will judge him at the last day. It's the same word. This is the judge. This is what will condemn you or save you at the last day. No surprises. We like to think that God's going to pull out a whole different set of rules at that time. 
We just think, oh, I think, you know, God is going to go, ah, he's just making all that up. We like to think of God as different than the way he defines it. You know what? He could do that, but that's not for ours to question. This is for ours to follow. This is what the Bible says. You've got to trust us. This is the judge that will determine where people spend eternity, either in heaven or in hell. Another time, Jesus says in John 8, if you hold to my teaching, you're really my disciples. Then you know the truth, and the truth will set you free. I, I like how Jesus says, if you hold to my teaching, you're really my disciples. Why would he say that? You know, I wonder why would he say that? I mean, this is in the very beginning. No one's been teaching about a year or two at this time. And he goes, already, there's people who are calling themselves disciples, who are kind of looking like disciples, who are acting like disciples, who some of the disciples think are disciples, but who are not really disciples. And so he goes, here's the test. If you hold to my teaching, you're really my disciple. As contrasted with those pseudo-disciples out there. With those would-be disciples, wannabe disciples. Only if you hold to my teaching. Not if you sing religious songs about me. Not if you just kind of say a bunch of prayers to me. Not if you just kind of look or dress like you think a Christian should look or dress. Not where you go to church. But if you hold to my teaching, you're really my disciple. Listen to the Bible now. Again, he says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Matthew 7, that passage, boy, that's a mind bender. Remember that passage where he says, but, you know, he says, just starts off that way. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, he goes, you know, many will come to me and say, Lord, Lord. Did we not prophesy in your name? Did we not drive out demons in your name? Did we not perform many miracles in in your name? And he says, I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. See, we're not talking about the people who didn't believe in Jesus. We're saying the people who believe in Jesus, who are totally convinced they're saved, who perform miracles in Jesus' name, who drive out demons, change lives in Jesus' name, and who don't just call Him Lord, they call Him Lord, Lord. He says many of those are lost. What? Sometimes we get, you know, kind of look at, oh, you're you're so, you know, negative about other people. You're so judgmental. I certainly don't want to be judgmental. But I look at Jesus as being so extremely exclusive. Many of the most committed religious people, many of them, I will tell them plainly, I never knew you away from me, you evil do it. And then he goes on to describe, it's only he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. It all comes back to the book. Those are the only ones who are going to make it. Not my words, not just our church's words. These are all Jesus' words. If we believe in Jesus, if we believe Jesus is the way to heaven, then we've got to trust what He's saying about His Word and listen to the Bible now. Ask yourself, are you listening to the words of God? I mean really listening. Not did you listen long ago and now you're on the right track, but are you listening to the words of God right now? He says we've got to listen to the Word of God. Are you obeying the words of God or are they just too hard? Are you persevering in the words of God or are you compromising? Are you living out the words of God or are you undecided, still contemplating? Are you sharing the words of God or are you too self-absorbed with your own agenda? Do you know what the Bible teaches about salvation? Do you really know? Are you sure? Not what you hear on Caleb or what you grow up with, but do you really know? Not, well, I think. Well, you know, I just imagine. Sometimes we all do that, but, but we're not God. We're not the Word of God. Do you know what the Bible teaches about how to become and how to remain a Christian? Do you really know that? Don't believe me. Don't believe your feelings. Don't believe your pastors, your parents, the Pope. Just believe the one and only source of salvation, the Word of God. Listen to the Bible now. You know, I remember this time in St. Louis that we had this neighbor day. It was a great neighbor day. 
had so many people come to church that day. And afterwards, for some reason, I was drawn to this one guest. She came up and talked to me. She was an atheist, and I'd been an atheist. And so we really had this connection. She was a student at University of Missouri at St. Louis. And she came up and just started sharing her heart about how she didn't believe in God, but, but she wanted to know more about God. And we talked the entire fellowship. Matter of fact, I felt guilty about it later because when I turned around after talking to her on stage, all the other guests are gone. I'm like, man. But I thought, there's just this special connection. And I asked her to study the Bible. Her name was Julie. I said, hey, would you study the Bible? Yeah, I'd love to study the Bible. And I talked to some of the sisters that were there. Hey, make sure you study the Bible with her. Yeah, we'll do that this week. Just a short while later, I don't remember the exact time, just a couple weeks later, I go and pick up the Sunday newspaper. And there's Julie, literally on the front page of the Sunday newspaper. It says, Julie, I won't mention her last name, murdered at Chain of Rocks Bridge. And there's this, this bridge over the Mississippi where people could walk on. And she was murdered. And I just saw her face and just had this flashback to, to her being at church and us having this in-depth, this, this spiritual conversation. I called up the sisters. Whatever happened with Julie? Did you guys study the Bible? And they go, no. She was just too busy to set up a time and get together. Are you too busy to really listen to the words of God? I think of this other guy. We called him Newt. His name was Anthony. And Newt was a, was a wrestler. Mark Van Tyne reached out to him, and he became a Christian. Mark was so encouraged that he had another wrestler on the team who was a disciple. And then Newt started struggling and backsliding. Started getting some non-Christian girlfriends and started doing things that Christians just don't do and God doesn't put up with. And Newt bought a motorcycle. was all fired up about his motorcycle. He came by the desk. I worked in the dorm at that time. He came by the desk and showed me his motorcycle, and he said, yeah, but the headlight is intermittent. Sometimes it goes out. And I said, dude, you shouldn't drive that. I mean, you could be driving that at night. He goes, oh, it'll be okay. Well, one night, he was driving over to his girlfriend and doing what Christians shouldn't do. And on the way back, he's driving super fast in traffic. And he tried to pass around one car, and his headlight had apparently gone out. And this other car coming the other direction didn't see him hit him head on. And, and literally just destroyed him to nothing where they could not tell his gender. They had to dig out his driver's license just to see whether he was a male or a female. And they contacted people in the church and just go, man, Nooch's time came. And it came at a bad time for him. Christianity was just too hard. And he'd stop listening. I think of this other time this guy Carlton that I helped become a Christian. He went home for a summer, started fooling around with a non-Christian girl and just telling him on the phone, Carlton, man, take your stand. You can't compromise like that. He goes, I know I shouldn't. I said, bro, have you ever even studied the Bible with this girl? He said, no. I said, bro, what would you do if she died in a car wreck tomorrow? Gosh, he said, man, yeah, I need to study him. What do I do? So I talked him through how to do the Bible studies. Just a little bit. I go, you don't, you don't have to go through everything. Just go through this basic stuff. And we talked for a long time on the phone. He was home in Kentucky. Just a short while later, I get a call. And it's actually his mom, Carlton's mom. She goes, John Carlton is too shaken up to talk. But his little girlfriend, Yolanda, was just killed in a car accident. And he gets on the phone. He's like, God. He's just like so shaken up. I said, Carlton, did, did you ever study with her? No. We just never got around to it. And I hated that I said, what if she died in a car wreck tomorrow? But then I thought, no, it was the right thing. I should have just said it earlier, and he should have listened. See, times come. And the question, the only question is, are we really listening to the Word of God? Or is it too hard? Are we too busy? Do we just not make the time for it? Think about where you're at spiritually at this hour. If I could, I just want to address the teens because I love the teens. And let me tell you, the sharing was just inspiring. Like I just, I, I felt like a God focus and a passion and confidence and esprit de corps in the teen ministry that I've not felt since I've been here. And I just, I, I don't know if everyone's on the same page, but I go, man, I applaud you. You guys are doing some awesome, awesome things. I believe in you so much. But I want to ask you, are you really listening to the words of God? Are you ready to meet Jesus? 
See, sometimes we think studying the Bible as a teen is like this rite of passage. And we kind of, you know, we get together once a week, if our parents can arrange the ride, and we just kind of have time. And at some point, if everyone thinks we're ready, okay, then we'll get baptized and they all lift us up and say how awesome we are. That, that's not the way I see conversion in the Bible. In the Bible, I see this radical, oh my God, I'm lost. Jesus, save me. I repent. Like diving through a, a pane of glass, just whatever it takes to violently, radically enter the kingdom of God. Do you view it that way? Sometimes even as parents, and I've got to appeal to the parents, we think of it like this process. And like as long as they're under our home, they're not lost. But listen, there's a point. You're born in a right relationship with God. There's a point the light goes from green to red. There's a point, a specific point. I don't know when it is. Some point in your maturing process that you become lost. And it doesn't matter how many Christian homes you go to or how cool or spiritual your parents are or what church you go to. There's a point you're lost if you're not a Christian. You can't be waiting for a feeling or waiting for perfection or waiting until it just sits right in your heart. You've got to go, man, if I'm lost, I need to get right with God. And I don't, I'm not saying you've got to rush it too much, but I'm saying, darn, there's an urgency. We've seen teens' kids who were lost and died. And those parents appealed, listen to the Word now. Don't let that happen to you. Your time will come. Are you ready? For those studying the Bible, there's some that are kind of on the lifetime plan of studying the Bible. You've been coming for a while and it's kind of like you're approaching the kingdom of God asymptotically. You know, between every point, there's another point. It's kind of a calculus thing, you know, but you're getting closer and closer, but you're never getting there. There's a point you've got to go, I know enough. Are you going to always be learning but never recognizing the truth? Or are you going to go, I know enough, I need to repent of my traditions, of my sins, and commit to the Lordship of Jesus and surrender my life. You have a whole lifetime of God's grace to figure out how to make it right and perfect yourself. But becoming a Christian, again, it's just a radical, simple conviction to make Jesus the Lord of your life. There's an urgency to this. For those of you that are Christians, there's some who are Christians that are thinking about, "Ah, I don't know, I can't picture myself doing this for the rest of my life. And you're kind of going through the motions, but, 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 but are you thinking about putting the helmet of salvation down? Are you thinking your life will be better if you go back to the other side? How is that going to make anything better? Well, I just can't do this anymore. So what are you going to do instead? Have a crummy life and then be lost in the end? Or just persevere? You know, he says, in this life, Lazarus did not receive good things. Sometimes our life is hard. Sometimes we just don't receive good things. But eternity far outweighs it all. Don't ever give up your salvation. It's the most important, precious thing you have. If you're considering being restored, and you go, yeah, I'm working on being restored, I appreciate that. But when are you going to be restored? What, what is worth waiting for? If you know it's right, you're coming to church, you know you got baptized for the right reasons. Well, just get restored now. Just go, okay, I'm restored. I want to be right. You know, get with me. Tell me when I am. Okay, that's right. I come in. Okay, I'm in. And I don't mean to short sight. I mean, just repent. Do whatever you need to do. Because this is the most important thing in life, to be right with God. All of your friends and family who passed away ahead of you, everyone, everyone on the planet, whose time has already come, is literally crying out for you to listen to the Word now. Those who are lost are crying out. Do not come to this place of torment. They're not trying to appeal to you to hang on to your family traditions. They're not appealing to you to, to, to not change and get baptized. They're saying just the opposite. Don't come here! Those who are in heaven are crying out, Please come here. Please don't ever let go. Literally everyone who's ever died is crying out to you to listen to the Bible now. Listen to the Bible. And they're crying out for you to warn your friends. It's funny, in this world we get so deceived, people cry out to us to not share our faith, don't they? Our conscience cry, or our feeling, our insecurity cries out, 
don't share. You'll look like a fool. You know, they think you're dumb. They think you're religious. You know, should I share with this waitress? No, don't. She'll be offended. Don't we have that little voice? And then other people, if you do share, they kind of look at you like, religious person? You're not supposed to share in public. Everyone in this world cries out, don't tell them. Everyone in that world cries out, please tell them. Don't shut up. Shout it from the mountaintop. And there's more people who died than there are alive. Who are you going to listen to? They're crying out to stay saved, to become saved, and to help other people be saved. The secret to eternal life. This is what Jesus, it's what made Him so different. Again, He alone has the words of eternal life. The secret to eternal life is only found in Jesus and His Word. Remember these four ancient truths. Your time will come. Heaven and hell are real. The decision is final. So listen to the Word now. And to God be the glory as we listen to the Word and as one day, God willing, we all walk up that stairway to heaven. God bless you.